So welcome. Um, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Carrie Blood. I'm the Community Engagement Director with Kestrel Land Trust, and we're based in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, we have particip participants from all around the country today, which is exciting, um, from California to Georgia to Canada. So we welcome you all as well. And I'd also like to thank our local business sponsor, Gardeners Supply Company in Hadley, Massachusetts, for supporting this event. Um, tonight is the first program in our new online speaker series, Ecological Solutions to Climate Change. As we all know, our rapidly warming planet is the biggest challenge humanity has ever faced, and we need all the solutions on the table. Protecting forests and other undeveloped lands is one of those solutions, which is why Kestrel's mission to conserve and care for these lands is more important than ever. And it's why we're hosting this speaker series. A couple of housekeeping notes tonight. Um, this is a webinar, so you will not see other participants. Uh, you will be able to ask questions at the end of the presentation, and you'll be able to do that by typing your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, we will read them out loud and try to get as, to as many of them as we can. We are recording this program, and we have not used this webinar our interface before. It's our first time, so please bear with us if there are any bumps along the way. I will now turn it over to Marilyn Castriata, Kestrel's Community Engagement Coordinator. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, so I want to introduce Doug, Dr. Doug Ptolemy. He is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. The author of several books, including Nature's Best Hope, A New Approach to Conservation That Starts in Your Yard, and dozens of research articles. Doug eloquently makes the connection between insects plants and animals, which of course includes us, and makes the case for our role in keeping these connections intact. Dr. Ptolemy is creating a homegrown national park, a 20 million acre network of viable habitats, providing vital corridors connecting natural areas. This approach to conservation empowers everyone to get involved in sustaining our natural world. He says, we can do this one person at a time. So let's go. <laughs> it's my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Doug Ptolemy. Doug, we need you to unmute. Okay, how about that? Much better, thank you. Excellent, good, thanks. All right, um, let, let's get started. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. We do have, uh, we've got some major problems on planet Earth. Climate change uh, is, is a deadly problem, but so is biodiversity loss. And fortunately, the solution to both of them can be what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, I do call it nature's best hope, but before we get into that, let's talk about what E.O. Wilson's 2016 book was all about called Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. I'm sure you have, have all heard that uh, Dr. Wilson died the day after Christmas. It was a terrible loss to the world of conservation. Uh, but one of the themes that, that uh, pervaded his, his very long career was the fight to save life on planet Earth. He loved biodiversity. He wanted to keep it around, um, not just because he loved it, but because we need it. So he wrote Half Earth. And in that book, he said, in order to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we have to save it on at least half of planet Earth. We have to save nature, functioning ecosystems on half of planet Earth. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. 
He didn't spend a lot of time telling us how we're going to do that. Of course, to a conservation biologist, that's music to our ears. You know, well, yeah, let's put half of the earth aside uh, and, and everything will be great. Problem is half of planet earth is already in some form of agriculture and we've got almost 8 billion people in the other half with all of our, our uh, infrastructure, our airports, our roads, our detritus. And we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how is this possible? Well, I do think it's possible. I think we can realize EO's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation to do that. And that is what I wanna talk about tonight. But let's go back to 2019 when there was a big uh, red oak uh, mast or at least members of the Red Oak Group. An oak mass, this is when all the members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. This is what it looked like in a lot of places. Not sure if it went up as far as, as Amherst, but um, much of the East Coast looked like this. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. But I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head. Then it forced its head through there. Then it forced its entire body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze made him look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped down. That's a dangerous time for this insect larva because it's good to eat. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface, it takes about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and creates a chamber. And within that chamber converts itself to a pupa. Surprisingly, it stays underground as a pupa for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they have big noses, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and their mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. And they take those mouth parts and chew a hole into the center of the egg corn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole. And that's how the larva gets into the egg corn. You might wonder why they spend two years underground, why don't they come out the next year as most insects would? And the answer is it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the next year, there wouldn't be enough egg corns for them. Of course, once they leave the egg corn, they, they leave a hole, a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by egg corn weevils after they've left the egg corn. And if scouts find a new hole with a new egg corn, they get all excited because their old egg corn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move the colony time to grab the, uh, the larvae, grab the eggs. They work very hard and move the entire colony into the new egg corn in about 30 minutes. And then they post a guard here, make sure nobody else comes in. And that's where they'll live for the next two years. What's my point? The point is that is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of acorns. They'll take an acorn, fly up to a mile from the parent tree, then they tap that acorn beneath the surface of the soil, and the object is they're going to go back in the wintertime and find it and have something to eat. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they're actually planting three new oak trees. A specialized relationship between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. This guy's beak is filled with carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants. And you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilii, unless you have this plant, Facilia. That is the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees in North America, and over a third of them are highly specialized on particular pollens. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could go on and on talking about specialized relationships in nature. My point though, is that today these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, stood on the edge, looked out over it and said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave it as it was. Um, it's only about 5% of the country that's anything close to its original pristine ecological state. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it, we have drained it, we have grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in the US that's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course we have paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. 
We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other remnants to sustain the amount of nature that we need them to sustain to run the ecosystems that we all depend on. You might wonder why we've done this. I wonder why we've done this. Uh, and I don't know, but I, I suspect that we thought that, that the earth, our nest was so big, we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. Uh, but of course we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this at a uh, unfortunately rapid clip. Like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years, 3 billion breeding birds, a third of our North American bird population already gone. Then we have this one, the, the UN says, we're gonna lose a million species to extinction probably in the next 20 years. Yeah, I don't know if you remember, but about two months ago, we removed 23 species from the endangered species list, not because we'd save them, but because they're already extinct. So this is happening but we can't allow it to happen. Losing a million species is simply not an option. So I could go on talking about the, uh, the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses, but that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, people like you and me, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if Earth lost its insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappear, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even many of our freshwater fishes. Those food webs would collapse and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would, would rot because we would have lost insect uh, decomposers. And all we would have is bacteria and fungi to, to decompose things. Of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here, uh, and that is none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself and thus ourselves, but we're gonna to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on life support systems that our ecosystems deliver. We call them ecosystem services. Here are just a few things that plants do that we depend on, like produce oxygen, pretty important, clean our water, slow its journey to the sea where it's too salty to use, Carbon capture, of course, that is the key to, to biological solutions to climate change. We've got to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, take that carbon, lock it up in plant tissues, and then pump the extra carbon through roots into the soil. Our soil scientists tell us that uh, the earth's soils can, can sequester seven times the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere right now. All we have to do is get it into the ground, and it's plants that do that. Plants build topsoil and hold it in place. They prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, they convert sunlight to food. If we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight and that would be hard. Uh, ecosystem services delivered by animals. What are animals doing for these plants? They're providing pest control services. They're pollinating nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They're dispersing plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's a downright terrible idea because we've got so many people on the planet demanding so many ecosystem services. Again, almost 8 billion people now. Now we do have parks and we've got preserves uh, and, and you know they're out there. They're doing their job, but they're too small and too isolated and there's too few of them to do enough of their job. So rather than simply practicing conservation within parks and preserves. We now have to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves. That includes the forest that, that the land trust is trying to save, but it also includes places like this that we have to reforest, get those plants back into. And most of it's on private property. Alba Leopold, 
was one of the visionaries uh, in the past century that recognized we humans need to work on our relationship with planet Earth. Uh, and and uh, he wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s, said lots of very important things. But one of the things he did say that, that resonates with me is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. And we haven't been very good at doing that. There have been indigenous groups that have been pretty good at doing that, but our huge Western societies, our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area. Then we go to another area and wreck that too. Not sustainable behavior. But Aldo Leopold had a lot of, uh, a lot of faith in, in humans. He believed we were capable of developing what he called a land ethic. Uh, he, he knew we had to use the earth. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. Uh, but he believed we could do them, we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called a land ethic. And he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure where that was, but I suspect the notion that humans in nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. What I wanna argue this evening though, is that not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We need to save nature, actually reconstruct it where there are a lot of people, because that's most everywhere. In other words, we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, but, but thrive. Where are we going to start? Well, back to private property. We have to focus on private property because most of the land is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. It's either 95 or 98% of Texas is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're gonna fail. Now, when I talk about conservation, I'm not really using the word correct, but we do wanna conserve any areas that are not already wrecked, absolutely. But we also need to restore the areas that we have where we have dismantled nature. And in order to do that, we have to start with the building blocks when we're, when we're reconstructing ecosystems. Not all species contribute to ecosystem uh, function equally. So we have to start with the ones, the most important ones, and we can add other species later. And there's two groups we can't do without. Uh, one is the flowering plants that are capturing energy from the sun and turning it into food. That's the food that drives uh, the rest of life on earth. And of course, we need the pollinators that allow those plants to, to uh, reproduce. Well, now we have the energy from the sun uh, in stored in plant parts, mostly leaves. Excuse me, I'm gonna cough here. <coughs> That's right, I'm gonna live. Uh, now we gotta get the energy from these leaves to animals. Most animals don't eat plants directly. Most animals eat, most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate those plants, those invertebrates or insects. And it turns out that caterpillars are enormously important in terms of transferring energy from plants to other animals. Uh, caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we don't design landscapes that include a lot of caterpillars, we have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. I'm gonna give you an example from Carolina chickadees. Uh, that's the chickadee in the south. It's the one that's at my house in southeast Pennsylvania. You guys have the black cap chickadee, practically the same bird. Uh, well, they're the birds at our feeders uh, right now, and we tend to think that that's all they need is, is seed. 50% of their diet in the wintertime is, is seeds. The other 50% is insects and spiders in the wintertime. And when they're reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds at all. So they switch entirely to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? There's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that. But this is a, a citizen science project that one of my uh, grad students did a few years ago, uh, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call to bird photographers around the country 
and said, please take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they're carrying food to the nest. Send those pictures to me and I will identify them. I identify the prey items that are in the beaks of those birds and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of birds in North America as possible. Uh, and, and the bird photographers loved it. They sent her thousands of pictures. She did all those identifying identifications. And this is a summary of, of her results for the 20 most common bird families in North America. The green bars are the percentage of the nestling diets that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, what would happen if we developed landscapes that didn't have enough caterpillars? Most of our birds would not be able to successfully reproduce. So what's, there's something special about caterpillars. What, what is it? Actually, there's a number of things special about caterpillars. Uh, and one of them is that they're, they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. A thin wrapper is his exoskeleton, it's cuticle. It's made of chitin and it's undigestible and the birds don't want a lot of that. Uh, and because they're soft, you can stuff the caterpillar down the throat of your offspring without, without fear of injuring it. Uh, if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. Their beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items uh, compared to, to other insects. Uh, a, a one medium-sized caterpillar equals to the, is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're also nutritious. They're high in fat, high in protein, low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible and many beetles have uh, uh, sharp edges too. Then finally, it turns out caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. And I mentioned carotenoids, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate. And you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants and we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? Well, from, from the prey items that they're feeding their young. Uh, but look, the carotenoid content of various bird prey items is not at all equal. The first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey because they're eating the green leaves that have the carotenoids in them. Here are the adult caterpillars here, the birds and the, or the uh, butterflies and, and moths. They have fewer carotenoids because they're not eating the green leaves. And here's the earthworm way over here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Uh, so that and other studies are strongly suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They are essential parts of most birds' diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Well, that's a good question. Let's go back to, to chickadees because there is a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands of caterpillars, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest, where they fledge. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to make one clutch of, of chickadees, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And a chickadee is, weighs a third of an ounce. It's a tiny bird. That's four pennies worth of bird. And if you want a chickadee to breed in your yard, you've got to have all those caterpillars in your yard because they only forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if you don't have all those caterpillars in your yard, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is directly related to the bird declines that we're seeing. We went to the uh, original data set from Rosenberg et al. That's the Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial birds into two groups, the species that require insects, typically when they're breeding, and the species that don't require insects. So things like doves and finches can actually reproduce on seeds. They make a little milk out of the seeds and that's what they feed their, their young. They didn't, uh, they didn't decline at all in the last 50 years, but the birds that require insects declined on average 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that when you take bird food away, you lose the birds. Which means if we want birds and other wildlife around that depend on insects, we're gonna have to change the goals 
uh, for how we landscape. In the past, we've landscaped with one goal in mind, and that was to make pretty landscapes. Uh, now we have to include ecological function in, in plant choices. Uh, so let's say we want to add caterpillars to a landscape. How do we do that? We add caterpillars by adding the plants that support those caterpillars. That seems pretty easy, but there is a catch, and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars, which means we have to be fussy about it. We've got to choose the plants that do, and we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about which plants they can eat. And the monarch butterfly is a perfect example. Everybody knows monarch butterflies require milkweeds. You can have all the crepe myrtle and all of the breadford pears and all of the burning bush and all of the buckthorn and all of the hostas and all of the things that we typically landscape with, all those plants from Asia in our yards, and we won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's going to make a monarch butterfly is one of the milkweed species. That's called host plant specialization. And it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? because plants have made them specialized. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. That's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Every 90% of the insects that eat plants, 90% are host plant specialists. Why? Because every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And an insect species cannot adapt to all of them. That's way too hard. So they pick one or two that are very similar in how they protect themselves. And they develop the adaptations necessary to get around those particular defenses. They develop the specialized enzymes uh, that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those compounds. It takes a long period of evolutionary history with those, those plants for all those adaptations to fall into place. And when they do, the insect is locked into eating that plant. So if you take the milkweed out of your yard and put hostas in there, the, mon the monarch cannot start to eat hostas. It, it is not adapted to eating hostas. So it has two choices, move and find milkweeds or starve to death. And that's why when we bring in plants from other continents, um, they destroy food webs. Our insects are not adapted to eating any of those plants. So it's not just the plants we put in our yards because many of them then escape and become invasive species and change the, particularly the understory of our natural areas as, as well, destroying food webs there. So all I'm trying to say is if we're trying, trying to put food webs back together again, if we're trying to create functional ecosystems, plant choice matters. We've got to choose the plants that are good at doing that or it's not gonna work. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how well it does work when we do choose the right plants. And I'm gonna start with, with our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. That's what it looked like when we moved in. And we got, uh, there was a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots. We got one of those lots. It had been mowed for hay before we moved in. Uh, so there were very few woody plants there. There are very few plants, period. And our goal was to restore the biodiversity of this, this part of the world. And in order to do that, we have to put the caterpillars back. So I'm gonna give you some, some uh, examples of how that worked. We wanted to attract the Canadian outlet. That's what a Canadian outlet looks like. I'd never even seen a Canadian outlet. And that's what the adult looks like, just like, uh, just like a leaf. Well, in order to have Canadian outlets, you have to think about host plant specialization. What do they eat? They eat meadow roux, and that's all they eat. And we didn't have any meadow roux. No meadow roux anywhere around here. This place had been farmed to death for 300 years. Most of the native plants are gone. Uh, so I got some, some meadow root seeds from someplace and planted them, and they grew really nicely. But this was, this was early on, and I actually had uh, very little faith that, that Canadian Alice would be able to find my little patch of, of meadow root. I had no idea where they'd be coming from. So I didn't even go out and check my meadow root for about two months after I planted it. And one day I was walking by for another reason. And it was covered with, with uh, Canadian Alice. They had come right away. I'm still surprised about that. So um, it was a great success. Now we got a good population of Canadian outlets and a good population of meadow root. 
we've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's actually a misnomer. This beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa, ditch daisy. I did know where there was some Biden's aristosa in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some, some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. Uh, well, it took a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my, my Biden's, uh, but they did. And now we got a good population of both of those. So uh, now we've added four species to the property. Same story with the Hackberry Emperor. I wanted the Hackberry Emperor, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs here. It's one of the species that ought to be here. One of the species that used to be here before we wiped out its host plant, which of course is Hackberry, Celtus. We didn't have any Hackberry, so I planted Hackberry. It took four years for the butterflies to find my Hackberry, but it finally did. I looked at one of my hackberry branches in June and there were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on a single branch. So another big success. Now we've added six species to the property. And that's how it went. Now I didn't plant goldenrod, it came in on its own, but along with it came many of the things that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth, this, uh, believe it or not, it has, is the goldenrod flower moth, and it hasn't come to our property. I don't know why it hasn't found our property, but it, but it hasn't. That's what the caterpillars look like, but it's still, it's part of the fun. This is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I, I go out and I look for these beautiful caterpillars. One of these years I'm going to find it, and that'll be a, a good year. Planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I hear people don't like it. I just don't know why they don't like it. In terms of, of a functioning native plant, it's a great species. It's got good fall color. It can climb our trees without girdling them and pulling them down. It's a good ground cover. It makes nutritious berries for the birds in the fall. They want high fat berries and it does that. It's actually a good pollinator plant. Uh, the flowers are very small and inconspicuous, but you know your Virginia creeper is in bloom when there's this cloud of native bees swarming all over your Virginia creeper. Remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's okay. I planted it because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moths that are a primary component of cardinal diets, like things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult. The lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. Wanna see if I can get the double tooth prominent at our house, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you've got to like this guy. Well, it's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm. Of course, we lost our American elm to Dutch elm disease decades ago, but there are two big American elm trees at the University of Delaware that did not die. And every year they make lots of seeds. So I planted some of those seeds at home. They grew very nicely. Those trees are now 80 feet tall. Uh, and that was, that's about 18 years, not that long. And they got the, they brought the double tooth prominent in. So uh, another big success, American elm. Wanted to get the evening primrose house, uh, moth at our house because uh, it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. And believe it or not, we had no evening primrose, no, no enothera at our house. So I planted it. The moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oak trees. Now, these are just examples of, of the plants that we put at our house. And I want to focus on oaks for a while because they're such important plants. This is the Bedford oak in Bedford, New York. Some of you might recognize it. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right. You won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak is doing on your property, if you can enjoy the ecological contributions it starts to make immediately, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I, I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free or as two foot bare root whips, which means uh, they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to rebuild the food web that it depends on caterpillars, the, the moth dependent food web by bringing in things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, 
the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on my property and they come right away. This is a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves and here's a, a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. <clears throat> so you don't have to wait decades or, or even a single year before your oaks start to contribute to your local food web. This is what it looks like from the same place I took that first picture uh, in, the, in the summertime at our house. We've got a little lawn here, we're very traditional, but we put a lot of plants back. And right away I noticed that as we put the plants back, uh, the, the life that those plants support started to come. Uh, and in the meantime, our research showed that uh, caterpillars are extremely important to local food webs. And if you, if you have a good uh, idea of the number of caterpillar species in your food web, you've got a good idea of how stable and complex that food web is. So I started to take pictures of all the caterpillar species, all the moth species that I could find at our, our house. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. Uh, I'm still at it. But so far I have taken pictures of 1,140 species of moss right on our property. And we do have 10 acres, but Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land mass, we have 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of these are types of, of bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline that we see now and then. World Wildlife Fund says that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. It's a scary statistic, but I'm thinking not at our house. I am sure we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds uh, and it didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. All we did was put the plants back. So yeah, these are scary statistics, but um, don't give up. We can turn this around. And by we, I mean everybody. We all have to re-vegetate planet Earth. And when we do that, that's going to pull a lot of carbon out of the air too. I know what you're thinking though. We've got 10 acres and a lot of people don't have that much land. So will it work on smaller properties, let's say in suburbia? That is a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. Uh, and, and they're in the middle of suburbia too. They're, all their neighbors had the big lawns. So when they moved into their house, the property was, was choked with bush honeysuckle, Amur honeysuckle. Uh, it's another very common invasive plant. So they got rid of all of that. They planted 75 species of native plants, put in a water feature they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds using their property. And they're still at it too, but they're up to 149 species so far, including 35 warbler species. Now that, you know, if you're a birder, you know, that's, that's a good number. To, to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. And again, we got 18 times more land than they have. So will it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards though? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, because when you, you look at that gray thing back there, that's one of the towers at, at uh, O'Hare Airport. Uh, Kennedy Expressway is right over here. Pam has one-tenth of an acre, three times less land than the average lot size in North America. And she's not connected to any wild space at all. So she's one-tenth, she's an island in the middle of, of Chicago. It's a beautiful island, but she did the same thing. She took out her invasive plants, put in... Uh, 60 species of native plants, water feature for the birds. And then she sat back and started to count her birds. And I've got to change this slide. She's up to 124 species that she's recorded using her yard so far, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house right there in Chicago. And there it is. Okay, there's five things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. And one of them is we've got to reduce the area we have in lawn. <clears throat> As of 2005, we had more than 40 million acres of lawn, and you know it's, it's increased since then. Dedicated to an ecological dead space. Now, I know we need lawn to advertise our, our high status, and we need lawn to display our Halloween decorations. 
But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? 40 million acres, let's cut that in half. What if we took an area like this and turned it into this? I got this picture from Dan Getman. I think he lives in uh, Northern Missouri. Sent it to me not long ago. Had a big lawn, but now he's putting in these native plants. And this is the early on, first couple of years of the planting. Well, we could, we could, we could make a new national park. If we do this at home, we can call it Homegrown National Park. It'd be 20 million acres in size. How big is 20 million acres? Well, it's bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home? We get the, you get the opportunity, you get the chance to develop a personal relationship with the natural world. Either for the first time, or you can rekindle one you had when you were a child. And you can do it at your own time and your own pace. All you have to do is go outside or maybe even just look out your window. You can avoid crowds. If you go to a real national park, there were 375 million people that did that last year. Um, you're going to sit in a parking lot. It's free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone. That's hard to do in a national park. Alone. That's so important. I don't know how you're going to develop that personal relationship with, with Mother Nature if you're not, if it's not just you and Mother Nature. And this is particularly important for our poor kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Louf. So we're trying. We, we get 30 kids and put them on a bus with a teacher and they drive for an hour and they walk around a natural area for an hour and the teacher tells them not to touch anything. And they get back in the bus and they go home and that's their experience with the natural world, which is certainly better than nothing. But it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of nature right where they live, all they have to do is go outside and, and make friends with it, get to know it. Again, I stress alone, no parental supervision. Let them work it out on their own. They will come home again. I guarantee it. This is so important because our kids are the future stewards of the planet. And if they don't know how to steward the planet, if they don't know uh, what stewarding is, if they don't love stewarding the planet, they're going to be lousy stewards. And we can't afford any more lousy stewardship. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe who lives in Hawaii in a very modest patch of nature. It's a piece of grass uh, with a hedge, but there are anole lizards there. And when she discovered that, she sent me this picture to explain how you catch them. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. Then you crawl slowly towards the lizard. No smiling, this is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, you learn how to take care of it. You learn how to be a good steward of that lizard. You develop that personal relationship with that part of the natural world. Now, I don't think Zoe's gonna be crawling on the ground in her best dress catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture the other day and so who knows. Uh, but I guarantee she's gonna remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I guarantee she's gonna be a good steward of the planet because of that experience. If you want your kids to, to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of how to expose your kids to the natural world right in your yards. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can do it now. Go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org. And the object is to get yourself on the map. And what do we mean by that? It means you, you uh, put your location where you live uh, in, in the, the data set and the amount of area that you are prepared to to save that you're going to restore. So the amount of lawn you're taking out or that you already have or a woodlot you're protecting. Um, and this goes for land conservancies too. We want everybody on the map. And when you do that, your little piece of your, your county is gonna light up with a firefly. So this is our attempt to reach beyond the choir. When I give a talk, it's almost always the choir who has invited me to give the talk. We've got to get this message that everybody's an important component of conservation to go viral. We want people to join Homegrown National Park just because everybody else is joining Homegrown National Park. Uh, and then they'll learn what conservation is all about. 
we want to see the whole U.S. light up. So please, oh, and it's free, by the way. And no, we're not using your your data. I don't even know what that means. So we're gonna we're gonna shrink the lawn. We're gonna join Homegrown National Park. Um, what plants are we gonna put in the area we take out of lawn? Well, some of them I'm gonna argue have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is, a stone in the middle of an arch. This is the Roman arch and the keystone is the stone that keeps that arch together. If you take that stone out, the arch collapses. But if you take keystone plants out of your, your local food web, the food web collapses because keystone plants are making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that hold up that house. They're essential. They're the support. You can't build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last century. You're not through building your house once you put the keystone plants in, but they're an essential part of it. So the question is no longer simply, are natives better than non-natives ecologically? On average, they certainly are. But the question really is, do we wanna use the native species that support the most pollinators and the most caterpillars or not? Uh, I get an email once in a while, or I used to anyway, from um, somebody who said, don't you know that ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia actually grew in North America 7 million years ago. That makes them native, that means we can plant them and everybody will be happy. Well, yes, I do know that the ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not gonna have that argument because that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not, it's whether they're doing anything or not. We have a lot of natives that don't contribute that much. So we wanna focus on the most productive ones. I don't care if ginkgo grew on the moon 7 million years ago, it produces zero species of caterpillars here today. And that's what counts. It is not contributing to local food webs. Notice no feeding damage on ginkgo leaves, nothing eats it. What is contributing more than anything else? It's one of our oak species. Uh, in the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. Uh, so in 84% of the counties in which they occur, oaks are the number one keystone plant. If you want to know what the keystone species are where you live, you go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of uh, woody plants and herbaceous plants at the genus level will pop up for your county. This is what a typical list will, would look like. Oaks are going to be number one, typically followed by uh, native, native prunus, native cherries, willows, blueberries very high and so on. So it's, I stopped this list because I ran out of room. It's a much bigger list than that. Notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows. If I go to the nursery and say, I wanna buy a cherry, they're gonna sell me an ornamental cherry from Asia. They won't, they won't think twice. That's what I'll end up with. If I wanna buy a willow, it'll be a weeping willow from Turkey. If I wanna buy a birch, it's probably gonna be a, a European birch or a maple will be a Japanese maple. You've gotta specify that you want a native member of these very important genera. Because if you get non-native members, it's gonna reduce caterpillar use by 68%. Here are the most important herbaceous genera, uh, not just in terms of making caterpillars, goldenrod support 110 species of caterpillars, by the way, uh, but in terms of supporting specialist bees too. Remember those bees, it can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plants. Well, if you have goldenrods and the various genera that asters are broken up into and perennial sunflowers, you can support at least 44 species of native bees that won't be in your yard unless you do have those plants. So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to attract a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, which is not the goal. A lot of uh, research showing that um, light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect decline around the country. And these are all the ways that, that uh, our lights do kill insects at night, particularly those all important moths that are creating those, those caterpillars. This is actually good news to me, folks. We've got to turn around insect declines. We've already lost 45% of the insects on planet Earth, and that's a 2014 statistic. Um, that's, that's not tolerable. We've got to turn that around, not just stop it, but we've got to increase uh, insect populations. And if we can do that by flicking a switch, by just turning out our lights at night, we're getting off easy. 
but I know what you're going to say. I can't turn the light out over my garage or I can't turn the light out over my front porch because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on those lights so that they only turn on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to find out is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of those lights and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb is the best because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects than are white wavelengths. If we switched out white lights for yellow bulbs overnight, uh, we would save millions of insects uh, and millions of dollars too, because LEDs of course are a lot more energy efficient. So we're gonna shrink the lawn, we're gonna put in keystone plants, we're gonna turn out our lights, then we're going to invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all of our insects. This is a, uh, this is a booming business around the country these days. Mosquito Joe is single-handedly undoing everything that I've been talking about for the last, I don't know, 20 years. But he says it's okay because uh, what, he's, what he's fogging is a uh, pyrethroid. It's a natural product. And he's right, it is a natural product. That's the same compound that's in chrysanthemums. Um, but cyanide is a natural product too. So, so I'm not sure that's a good argument. He also says it only kills mosquitoes. And boy, I wish he was right about that. But in fact, it kills all the insects it comes in contact with. I don't know if you saw the headlines uh, two, two years ago, there were big monarch kills when they flew through Mosquito Joe, hundreds of dead monarchs on the ground. Um, the thing is, it doesn't, it doesn't control mosquitoes. And you don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. That's too hard. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of the, the adult mosquitoes. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50%. So he's not even close to actually uh, performing the service that you're paying for. If you really wanna control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage. And this is the, the most targeted, cheapest way to do it. Uh, get a bucket. People say, how big a bucket? I don't care. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or, or hay and let it ferment for a couple of days. This is in the, the warm part of the year. What's happening in your bucket is you're building up uh, populations of diatoms and algae. And that is what mosquito larvae eat. So adult mosquitoes who want to lay their eggs, they'll lay their eggs in your bucket. That becomes an irresistible brew to them. Then you go to the hardware store and you buy a mosquito dunk. This is mosquito, this is uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a natural bacterium. And this is a formulation that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is mosquito larvae. So it's so targeted. If a dragonfly gets in there, it doesn't hurt it at all. If your dog drinks it or a bird drinks it, doesn't hurt it. You might put a coarse screen over your bucket so the chipmunk doesn't drunk, jump in and drown. But um, cheap targeted. If everybody did it, we'd control a lot more mosquitoes without killing anything else. Fourth thing we need to do is to uh, landscape in a way that allows these caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, this is just an example, but I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of, of caterpillars in that county alone. A few of them like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillars eat the leaves, then they spin a cocoon and hang from a branch, then they emerge as an adult, and then they do it all over again. And I wish everything did that, but most species don't. 94% of them, 480 species, complete their, their, their growth as larvae, as caterpillars on the tree, but then they drop from the tree and they wiggle their way beneath the soil to pupate underground, or they spit a cocoon in the leaf litter under the tree, and that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. The way we landscape in most places looks just like this. We've got grass right up to the trees. We mow and compact it so it's rock hard, and when the caterpillars fall down to pupate, they can't get underground, and there's no leaf litter. Uh, so I am convinced that the typical way that we landscape, and you know we do this everywhere, is another major cause of insect declines around the country. And of course, the cement landscape is not going to solve the problem either. This is what most people do. You've got a, got a tree in a yard. We're going to measure this summer how well caterpillars do in a situation like this, but I guarantee you they're going to do better in a situation like this, where you've got a tree and then a layered landscape. Maybe a dogwood up here, native azalea, ferns, ground cover. It's a safe site creates a soft landing for these caterpillars. They fall down, they can easily get underground uh, because the, the soil is not compacted. It's not gonna be mowed, it's not gonna be trampled. There's plenty of leaf litter there to spin a cocoon, much higher survivorship. 
This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. We're not asking for less gardening here. We're asking for more gardening. We want to put more plants back into the landscape. And this is a great way to shrink the lawn, put big beds around your trees, create those safe sites. Use your ground covers liberally. This is wild ginger or may apples or foam flower or ferns, all great safe sites. This is a hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maple trees. Any caterpillar developing on these trees can drop down, complete their development in this, this fern bank, even though it's the middle of a city. So we can, we can definitely do better in how we landscape under our trees in terms of helping our caterpillars. Okay, the fifth thing we need to start thinking about is if, if we really you know, respond to this and put good habitat back into our, our yards, we don't want to create ecological traps by doing that. So what do I mean? Well, if we attract birds to our yards and have the cat outside, the cat's going to eat the birds. Cats are killing two to three billion birds each year in North America, a third of the North American bird population killed by our cats. It's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. We can keep our cats inside. But here's another one, window strikes. Uh, and this is harder to deal with. Uh, because windows all over the place have this glare. Look, it looks like the, uh, the sky back there and the birds are flying, particularly when a hawk comes and attacks them. Bam, another billion birds killed each year because of the way we, we build our buildings. This is one of the, the uh, windows at my house. You can see the reflection. No wonder the birds are flying into it. But this is, this is what I've done with that. Um, these are bungee cords. You can get them at the hardware store and you suspend them from something up here. I've used a, a plastic uh, strip. Uh, it's very effective. Uh, we, have, we do not have any bird strikes when these things are working, except there's one period at one time of the year where the sun comes out in the right way and it makes these bungee cords almost invisible. And then occasionally we get a strike. I don't know what to do about that. This is what it looks like from the inside. It's a new aesthetic, but we can get used to it if we're saving a billion birds a year. Another grad student, Desiree Narango, uh, these, these students have all graduated at this point, did some wonderful work with Carolina chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And the results of her study suggest there's actually room for compromise in our plant choice. And that's good news to me. She asked one simple question. When you have a landscape that's dominated by native plants, how well do chickadee populations do over time compared to landscapes that are dominated by typical introduced ornamentals? She worked uh, again in typical suburban yards. They all had, had uh, nest boxes up in them. But the first thing she found is that uh, landscapes dominated by introduced plants produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So the chickadees would come and look around and say, well, there's not enough food here. We're not even going to try. If they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And if you put all that together in a population growth model, as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard, from no, no woody plant uh, to 100% non-native woody plants. And the reason we focus on woody plants is because that's where the chickadees forage. This is what you get. The dotted line here is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population um, has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this rate, uh, it's sustainable. Your population is not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer babies below the line here, uh, you have a shrinking, unsustainable population. So that happens when you've got this high percentage of non-native uh, woody plants in your yard. Right here is where those, those lines overlap. So it suggests very generously that you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native without destroying the local food web. Uh, so that's the area of compromise that I'm talking about. Uh, here's Dan Getman's landscape again. That's a ginkgo right there. Why does he have a ginkgo in his native plant landscape? Because his wife liked ginkgo and she asked him to put it in, so he did. Is that gonna destroy this landscape? No, it's not. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs, it's the absence of native plants. So let's get more of these guys in there uh, and not only will we absorb more carbon, but we'll also have more biodiversity. Can we use native plants in formal designs? 
Uh, of course we can. This is uh, a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design. She sent me this uh, last year. This is taken by a drone 400 feet up. It's a big garden and you don't get more formal than that. Every plant in this landscape is a native plant. So formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the, the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs all the time in Europe. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a typical suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Just put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It, it tells your neighbors that it's not just a bunch of weeds you forgot to mow. It's beautiful when it's in bloom. It services a number of species of bees. Not very big, could be bigger. But if everybody did it, it would still help a lot. We're trying to help pollinators. And what you hear all the time is you're helping pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. I don't like that argument at all. Because first of all, it's wrong. They pollinate about a 12th of our crops. And it suggests that if you don't live next to a farm, you don't need any pollinators. We need pollinators because they pollinate 90% of all plants or in all flowering plants, 80% of all plants. So if we lost our pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. That is not an option. Where do we need pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. What about this design? That's a Drew Latham design. It's much bigger. Imagine the amount of life serviced here versus the amount of life serviced here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Yes, they can, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has, has uh, kicked this off a couple of years ago with a, it's called the Lawn de Legume Program. It's a cost-sharing program where the state will uh, help you pay for converting uh, some or all of your lawn to appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. It's very popular. Pennsylvania has a, a brand new lawn conversion program. Well, it's about two years old now. You can get up to $5,000 per acre to convert your, your lawn uh, into native plantings. It was designed to help watersheds, but this is a good example of where uh, one conservation effort can, can accomplish a second one at the same time. You can help the watershed and help biodiversity at the same time. There's an island off of Florida where they're paying residents to allow the burrowing of a listed species to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. You pay people to be a good steward of the endangered species on their, their yard rather than fine them if they use their, their property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas, South Carolina, North Carolina, bounties on calorie pairs. You take out the calorie pair, you get a free tree replacement. And even utilities are getting into the act. $100 coupons to, to give to homeowners to plant water efficient native plants, particularly in the drier areas of our country and not the water thirsty non-natives. And of course the big lawn conversion programs in California, this has gone up now. It's you get $3 per square foot rebate if you take out your lawn and put in appropriate xeric plantings. And if you want information on these programs, it's right there. Okay, we have made three missteps in the early years of conservation, in my opinion. And the first one's really serious. We've come to think of nature as optional, which means it's not essential, which means when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, nature takes a back seat. We like it, we like to visit, but you know, it's not essential. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out. And there's this wall size poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We wanna save wildlife, save nature so that future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. These are wonderful, beautiful, scenic places. We wanna save them so the future generations can enjoy them. Uh, and I agree with all of that, but it suggests nature's there just for entertainment. It is far more important than that. Nature, if we, if we don't save nature, we're not gonna have future generations. It's not just about entertainment. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we talked about this, but if we restrict conservation efforts just to areas where there's not a lot of humans, we're gonna fail because those areas are too small and they're too isolated and too, too few of them. David Quammen has a great analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug that is not 71 Persian rugs. That is 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. 
I don't like that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, uh, including our roadsides, even including our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again, folks, by putting the plants back. Not just to, not just to sequester carbon, not just to, to create biological carters that connect viable habitats so the plants and animals can move back and forth, but to recreate viable habitats where we've destroyed them, where we live, where we work, where we farm, where we shop, where we play, everywhere. When we do this, when we put the plants back, it'll be the first time in modern history that humans have actually coexisted with the natural world. The third thing we need to do, or the third misstep that we have taken is to leave earth stewardship just to a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, a few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility for every human being on the planet. But I don't know why, because every human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of good Earth stewardship? Stan Resworth, a Cherokee elder once said, the Western settler mindset was I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you're taught them. We've been really good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. That doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it does empower you. Right now, so many of us feel powerless. The earth's problems are huge. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can use keystone plants, one person can turn out their lights, one person can get rid of the invasive plants that are already on their property. We didn't even talk about that. One person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can totally revitalize the, the land right where they live and then enhance their local ecosystem instead of degrade it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, that's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy. Help a park or a preserve. They're all underfunded, all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power, and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. So I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thank you very much. Okay, wow, that was that was wonderful, Doug. Thank you so very much. Um, just to just to let everybody know, we have recorded this presentation, and I'll be sending everybody the link to the recording so you can rewatch it um, and share with others. So let's see, we have a number of questions here, and um, I know that we have a bunch of students in the audience as well. So. If you have a question and you're a, a student, let me know that and I will bump you to the top. <laughs> um, <laughs> students have special rights. That's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a bunch here. I'm going to start with this one. With, with deer either very hungry or starving, what native plants have the best chance of survival in our yards? This is somebody who lives in Maryland. Yeah, you're talking about deer resistant plants and there are there are several. Uh, well, first of all, a starving deer will eat anything. So, but typically deer avoid spice bush, which is why spice bush is one of the most common native plants in our understory because the deer typically don't eat them. But when you only have deer resistant plants in your property, you're also not making very many insects because for the same reason the deer don't like them, the insects don't like them. The spice bush supports the spice bush swallowtail and a few other things, but it's very low on the, on the list. So the real solution, and I know it's hard for a, a single homeowner to deal with this, we've got to reduce the deer populations. Only putting plants out there that deer don't like is going to create a sterile landscape again. So deer are critically important 
uh, in terms of our invasive species problem. They have shifted the, the competitive balance against our native plants because they'll eat the native plants. Every little oak tree that pops up, they eat it. They won't touch the burning bush. They won't touch the barberry. They don't touch the autumn olive. And that goes crazy in our landscapes. When you take the deer away or minimize their populations, get them back below the carrying capacity, our, our native plants are quite competitive with these non-natives. So deer control is, is essential. It's essential for our invasive species problem. It's essential for forest recruitment so that you can get the young plants growing up and you get replacement when the old trees fall down. And it's essential in terms of controlling Lyme disease. These are good reasons to get our deer populations back under control. Okay, wonderful. Um, let's see. No, deer don't eat garlic mustard either, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question. How, what can I do on a shaded small lawn in, in a suburban area? A shaded small lawn. Right. Well, uh, there are plants that do well in shades. And actually, if you look <clears throat> in the, the back of uh, the living landscape is a, a book I wrote with Rick Dark. He wrote most of it. I just did a couple of chapters, but there are big lists in the back of that talking about plants in particular conditions and shaded plants in the mid-Atlantic is one of those, those lists. Or you can just ask, ask the Google, shaded plants in, in Maryland, Pennsylvania, wherever you live, and, and they will pop up. One plant that's particularly good in shade, if you're looking for flowering plants, if you're looking for a good plant for pollinators, even though you have a shaded area, is hydrangea arborescence. It's native hydrangea, straight species. Don't get hydrangea arborescence annabelle because that is um, that is essentially a sterile plant. They're, they're double flowers. It's it's showier, but you've taken away the the advantage of having pollen and nectar. But that plant will bloom uh, in in pretty heavy shade, and most plants don't do that, so that's good. Uh, but there are a number of ground covers. They're all good at at shade. Uh, so you know, again, that wild ginger I talked about the the. The uh, Virginia creeper is a good ground cover, but there's a lot of them. You can look for ground covers too, and they'll all do well in the shade. Um, and there's a number of trees or, or plants, bushes, shrubs, and things that will only flower in the sun, but they still grow fine in the shade. So you have a lot of options in a shaded area. Okay, great. Okay, here's a, here's a student's question. Thank you, Lily. How do you feel about golf courses? Can they be made eco-friendly or should we scrap them? <laughs> um, you know, we've got 2 million acres of golf courses. It's, it's more than Rhode Island and Delaware combined in golf courses. So you're talking about a big chunk of land. I don't know how many golfers we have, but we've got a lot of them. They might come hit you on the head with their golf clubs if you scrap them. So can we make golf courses much more eco-friendly? Yes, absolutely. Only about 50% of a golf course is, is the fairway. The rest of it is, is the rough. It's, you know, it's meadow and other, other unmowed areas. Um, they all could be landscaped much more um, eco-friendly by using a higher percentage of natives. Stop with the spraying. Uh, most golf courses, at least in the past, sprayed like crazy. There's a, a great study, it's dated now, but the, the correlation between um, the amount of time that men spent on golf courses and their likelihood of getting prostate cancer. The line went like this. So walking on these heavily sprayed greens is not a healthy thing to do. Golf courses are learning how to do this. There's even uh, an association for green uh, landscaping and golf coursing, golf courses. Uh, so that's starting to turn around. And if you are a golfer and you want your, your local golf course to be more green, say so. You know, if all the members say so, uh, they will they will do it. The the you know the 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 dial is moving in that direction. So we want to take advantage of this. Okay, great. That's interesting about the rise in prostate cancer um, yeah. due to all the pesticide use. Okay, here's another uh, question from a student. Thank you, Sophie. In class, we recently read a piece that championed the sustainability of densely packed cities and apartment living. How can we incorporate nature into those environments where many people own no outdoor land? That's an excellent question. And, and yes, uh, if people are packed into cities, the idea is that will leave much more natural area outside the cities. 
but we have to do that. What I see is we're packing people into cities and destroying the outside areas as well. That's where our shopping centers are. And, I, you know, it's so that only works when you have functional ecosystems outside of the cities. But 82 percent of us do live in cities. How can we have green areas there? You know, the the um, expansion of green roofs is one option. Uh, there's a number of, of uh, benefits of green roofs. Uh, you, you know, there there's a lot of types of biodiversity that are not going to use green roofs, but it could be great for pollinators. Pollinators are really good at getting around. They can fly high as well as they can fly low. Then if you use the right plants on a green roof, you can in, improve habitat for pollinators. Um, if you live in an apartment, the apartment typically does have a, a yard. And of course, the owner of the apartment building is going to landscape that yard in the way that's easiest to maintain for himself. But one thing I've been thinking about is, let's say there's a tree in the front yard, and I want you to put a big bed under that tree. But the, the owner says, well, you know, it's too hard, the mower can't get around, blah, blah, blah. He just doesn't want to spend the time doing it. So I suggest that people who live there, if you live in an apartment, go to the, you know, the, the owner or the super, whoever it is, and say, I want to adopt this tree. I'm going to landscape around it. I'm going to make those safe sites. I'm going to take care of it. It's going to be my pet baby. You don't have to spend a dime. It'll look great. And if everybody did that, you could have a very green landscape with no additional cost to the, the apartment owner. Uh, and this allows people to get outside and, and participate, even though they don't actually loan, own the land. So I'd love to see that actually happen uh, someplace. If, if anybody's done that, let me know. But that's one way you could, you could be part of it. But then also, um, let's say you're 90 years old and you're just not going to go out and, and, and uh, conserve land anymore. You still have a vote. So all of these people in cities, we feel so detracted or separated from nature that we forget about that. But who we vote for is going to determine whether or not we have policies that actually uh, move us in the right direction. That goes for climate change. It goes for biodiversity. It goes for all of these things. So make sure you vote with that in mind. Uh, make sure you donate with that in mind. Most people are donating to some charity someplace, like a land conservancy, uh, or Younger people can volunteer. That's those that be done on land yourself, then then help volunteer uh, uh, land conservancies and parks and preserves and the little old lady who still owns property but doesn't want to rake the leaves anymore. All of those people need need help. Great suggestion. The adopt the adopt a tree. Um, just want to remind folks there at the bottom of the screen there is a Q and A as well as a chat function, please put your questions in the Q&A. That's where I'm, I'm pulling these from. Um, okay, here's one. How can you protect a plant if the caterpillars eat off all the leaves? For example, witch hazel. Witch hazel? Well, I've never seen a defoliated witch hazel, but um, the leaves will grow back. You know, all the caterpillars that are out there, the native caterpillars have a whole suite of natural enemies. They're the birds that are eating hundreds every day. Then there's all of the, the um, invertebrate predators and parasitoids. There's a number of predatory insects that, that are out there picking off those caterpillars every day. A number of tiny little wasps, parasitic wasps that are killing those, paras those, those caterpillars every day. Usually what I hear is, you show me all these pictures of beautiful caterpillars and I can't find them. That's right, you can't find them because the bird's already eaten them or something has already killed them. The problem is too few caterpillars, not too many. So um, defoliation from natural causes happens, but rarely. Where we get defoliation comes typically from um, invasive insects, introduced insects like the gypsy moth or the big problems from the emerald ash borer, the insects we have brought in here that do not have their natural enemies. They're the ones that are causing the big, the big problems. So if you've got gypsy moth, you've got an invasive species on your property, uh, you know, pick them off or you don't want the gypsy moth to kill your oak tree. Uh, but, you know, of course, if you treat your oak tree, if you spray it with Bacillus thuringiensis, you're going to kill not just the gypsy moth, but everything that's on there. But maybe that's appropriate sometimes because you don't want to, your tree to be defoliated two or three years in a row. These are judgment calls. 
but typically defoliation from native insects is not the problem everybody thinks it is. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you, Doug. Here's one. Um, we have a new problem with Asian jumping worms in our area and the native plants in particular seem to struggle with the devastating effects of the worms. Do you have any suggestions for nurturing native plants to counteract the destructive or the destruction rather from these Asian jumping worms that won't harm the environment but will address the issue? I have two. Uh, they're not great. The Asian jumping worm problem is a, is a serious problem. It's just another one of these invasive species that's wreaking havoc. Uh, and, and very few people are working with it because they're so hard to, to, uh, to do research on. But there is recent evidence, this comes from Bern Blossie's lab at Cornell, that uh, when you remove deer, or when you don't remove them, when you have in an overabundance of, of deer, the Asian jumping worms do really well. When you take the deer away, they do much more poorly. They start to decline. And I said, Byrne, why is that? He said, we have no idea. <laughs> but if that turns out to be a real uh, correlation, that's another reason to, to um, minimize deer, deer pressure. The other thing is, is oak leaves. Uh, I did talk to uh, one of the women that was working on, on uh, invasive worms. This was years ago, but she said they don't like oak leaves because the oak leaves are, are big and tough. They're full of tannins and lignans, uh, and they're very difficult to eat. So when you've got good oak leaf litter, there are far fewer of these worms. They won't penetrate an area like that. It's another reason to get oaks back into our landscapes. Um, those aren't foolproof, but it's the best we have right now. So, oh, That's great, Doug. And would you like to would, would you like that to be a segue to introducing your your book on oaks? Oh yeah, um, sure. <laughs> um, that's my latest book. It's called The Nature of Oaks. Uh, it's it's a month by month guide to the life that you will see on the oaks in your yard. You can go out any month of the year and say this is what should be there and look for it. The idea is to is to give you the knowledge that should generate interest in what's happening on your oaks. And then interest often leads to compassion. It gives you a, a, another reason to love nature and plant more oaks. Oaks are the most powerful plant in terms of sequestering carbon, managing our watershed, helping biodiversity. The only thing they don't do better than other, other trees is help pollinators because they're wind pollinated. But three out of the four things that every landscape needs to do, uh, that's pretty good. So we should all focus on oaks. Okay, great. And just as a reminder, what's the name of your book? Nature of Oaks. Nature of Oaks, everybody. Okay, here's another question. Butterflies, are there any butterflies that are enemies to each other in consideration of planting these gardens? No. No. Okay. <laughs> now there, you know, th there are some caterpillars that are are predaceous under certain circumstances. So there's a very specialized inchworm in Hawaii that actually eats other inchworms. It's rare. Um, when you rear caterpillars together, occasionally one will eat another one. That's also rare. Uh, but again, that's all happening with moths. I don't know of any butterflies that have negative interactions with each other. So I'm just gonna say, no, don't worry about that. Okay, good to know. Uh, here's one. Uh, can we? Uh, can you talk about the problems of your neighbors using pesticides while you are trying to attract pollinators with native plants? Are we attracting pollinators to their deaths? It's a huge problem. <laughs> the mosquito fogging that your neighbor does does drift over and kill your your insects. I I, I uh, somebody called me the other day about a terrible. Um, gall problem on their pin oaks in St. Louis, the horned gall. It's going crazy in, in St. Louis. Uh, and I said, well, how much mosquito spraying do they do? Oh, we do a lot. Gallers are attacked by more species of parasitoids, other wasps, than any other group of insects. So what I suspect is happening is all of the parasitoids that control the galler are being killed by the mosquito spray. When you, this is mosquito fog and kills the natural enemies first. And then the other insects second, and then the mosquitoes third. So um, it does drift around and that's a big problem. Neonicotinoids, 
of any, any form, imidacloprid or any of the others, they are 7,000 times more toxic to insects than DDT was. And we use them all over the place. Every seed you buy that's pink or purple, that's covered with neonicotinoids. And only 5% of that material goes up into the plant you're trying to protect. The other 95% washes off into the watershed or blows away on dust. And if, you're, if your neighbor's doing that, it does hurt you. So I suspect your neighbor doesn't know that. Um, you know, neighbor, neighbors are problems. How do you, you got to get along with them. You don't want to have a war with your neighbor, but uh, to walk across the street and say, you're not living right. You should live like me. That doesn't work real well either. So it's a social issue, but yeah, the answer is yes. What he does, does affect you. So maybe we can all share your talk with our neighbors. Absolutely. Share the talk. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How about, um, does Massachusetts have a program to support uh, converting your lawn to a native plant garden like the one you described in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I, I don't know if it does, I don't know about it, but that doesn't mean it doesn't. Mm -hmm. I learn about these things when people tell me. Um, I, I, these days I just don't have time to even do my email rather than go out and, and see all the programs that are popping up. So Massachusetts may have some kind of a lawn conversion program. I just don't know about it. Massachusetts has banned the sale of certain invasive species, like I think uh, burning bush is one of them. Um, so, you know, they're moving in the right direction, but the actual programs they have to help homeowners, I'm not sure. Okay, good. Let's see, we have a few more minutes. Um, here's a question from a student. How would you recommend getting involved as a student in an urban environment? Uh, I would volunteer for a land conservancy. Right outside that urban area, there are land conservancies everywhere. And as I said before, they all need volunteer help. Um, or look, find somebody who's doing ecological landscaping and become an intern with them. Say, I will work for you to learn, learn the business, learn how to do this. Um, that's, a, that's a great way to help that business. And you can learn an awful lot that way as, as well. Okay, great. Um, let's see. I find that planting store-bought flower seeds tends to be a fail in my gardens, composted dirt or not. Any recommendations? Um, uh, you can collect seeds yourself. You have to have a little bit of knowledge and know how to do that. But you know, an easy seed to collect and plant yourself is an acorn. That is a seed. It falls from the ground. You pick it up right after it falls. Uh, if it's the white oak group, it's going to germinate in the fall. So you want to plant it where you want it in the fall and then protect it with a little cage so the mice don't eat it. If it's the red oak group, uh, you can put it in a Ziploc bag with some peat moss and put it in the refrigerator for the winter and then plant it in the spring. It'll germinate in the spring. Nothing's easier than, than that when you get your own material. Um, so that's what I would suggest. Okay, great. Well, we're nearing eight o'clock and we want to be respectful of everybody's time, including yours, Doug. We are just so grateful that you took the time in your evening to, to give this talk. It has been so informative and inspiring. And, and yes, there is something that we can all do um, to help uh, restore biodiversity right in our own backyards or, or communities. So that, that's, that's tremendous. Um, thank you, Doug. And I just want to let folks know that um, this talk, as Carrie mentioned earlier, was our first in our uh, series, Ecological Solutions to Climate Change. And uh, mark your calendars. The next one, the second one is March 31st. And that's titled Addressing Climate Change Through Land Conservation and Land, Steward uh, Land Stewardship. And uh, Scott Jackson of, of UMass Amherst will be our speaker. And then on April 14th, uh, Peter Curtis, Professor Emeritus from Ohio State University, uh, who's a forest ecologist, will talk on climate change and the pace of life in the valley. And that talk will be uh, around the uh, phen phenological changes. Uh, phenology is the, the study of cyclic and uh, seasonal natural phenomena. And uh, that's changing with, with our changing climate. 
So we hope that you can make other talks and um, look for my email with the link to this recording and uh, rewatch it, talk about it with your friends and family, share it widely. This is truly a solution, a natural solution. So uh, thank you so much, Doug. <laughs> You're welcome. You know, I saw a, a little chat pop up. They wonder if it, I should, they should use wet peat moss with that uh, egg crawler they're putting in the fridge. I would say damp peat moss, but yes, not dry. You want it to be damp so that it doesn't dehydrate over the winter. Okay, good. Great. Good you tip. are welcome, and I hope everybody has a great night.